The Pure Arrow 98 is one of the most dynamic rackets I've ever hit with. With a notable lean in the direction of being a spin heavy and somewhat powerful racket. However, the touch and control are still very present. So making adjustments with your shots is very intuitive. And it hasn't taken me long to find out that this racket is great at both pushing opponents way back and then having them scramble to the net for a lethal drop shot. This racket does extremely well with all depth of the court, and that's not an easy thing to achieve. As with any racket, and as tired as I am of hearing anything along those lines, it is true that it is the player more so than it is the racket. It's up to the player to bring out the strengths of a tennis racket. But I think where the chemistry between player and racket is really important is finding harmony with what you're looking for and what the racket offers. And that's gonna be different for everybody. Now, this might seem like too much to ask for, but I've continued my journey because I believed it's not. It's not too much to ask for. But I wanted a racket that had the ability to hit a flatter ball, if I so choose, but mostly be able to hit absolutely disgusting topspin. This racket does both well, but I said it does lean in the direction of spin. But it's capable of flattening out. Some rackets aren't as much. And it's extremely rare that a racket is able to do both as well as this one is, especially with how much topspin you get. This is one of the most topspin friendly rackets. So the fact that it's that and it can still flatten out for those shots where you want to, that's a big deal. Not easy to find that. It's not easy to find a racket that excels in both extremes. Does that make sense? I think as consumers, we're very used to expecting that one strength is going to mean another weakness. In other words, that every pro comes with a con. Any advantage comes with a disadvantage. And the trade-offs that we generally correlate are power for control spin for flat, but I think it's entirely possible that sometimes some rackets can just do both things a little better than other rackets. And as someone who is a believer of that, my search continued every single time I found that the combination of pros and cons was not to my liking with any racket. So let me tell you how I got to the Pure Arrow 98. This was a few months back or so, but my reference racket at the time and for a while was the E-Zone 98. And that was after coming from the E-Zone 98 Plus. So honestly, me and the E-Zone racket, especially the 98 Plus or Standard, have a lot of history together. And I had a lot of reasons for liking that racket. Most of the characteristics I found to be at least acceptable or good, but at the top of the list of things that mattered to me was decent power, great access to topspin, and especially then, a dense string pattern. That was so important to me. Some of you guys are saying, oh, it's a 16 by 19, that's pretty standard or pretty open. I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about string spacing, and I was obsessed with this at a time, and I still kind of am. But not all string patterns are created equal. And I made that very clear in a lot of my content not too long ago. And I pointed out with many examples that the E-Zone 98's string pattern, or string spacing, if you will, was actually more densely concentrated, especially around the sweet spot, than a lot of 18 by 20s. And that's saying something. And interestingly enough, I was still able to get great topspin with that racket. So there's an example of something that people might think is a contradiction. Really densely spaced strings, but I'm still able to get crazy topspin. To this day, I don't quite understand why, but that was the reality, whether or not I understand it. So that was a racket where I was able to get a really tight string spacing and still get really great topspin. And tight string spacing to me was very important at the time because I was tired of breaking strings like every three hitting sessions. Sometimes four, sometimes five, but it meant stringing more than once a week. And it wasn't until I discovered Restring Zero and Toroline Wasabi that I was able to pretty much double the amount of time a string was to survive in my racket. And it took quite some time, but eventually I opened up to slightly more open string patterns because using Restring Zero or Toroline already gave me a lot more time than I had become accustomed to with your typical polyester strings. Hyper-G, Torbite, RPM Blast, Luxalon, anything, etc., etc. I've tried so many strings, they all break within three to four hits or so. And my priority for polyester strings is decent tension maintenance, great topspin performance, decent enough comfort. If everything else is at least average, then that's great. It's got good topspin and so on. Long story short, Restring Zero and Toroline gave me a lot more topspin than anything else ever has, and it gave me twice the durability. So with those things being so important to me, Restring Zero and Toroline Wasabi very, very quickly became the string to beat for me. And to this day, nothing has come close. And if your top priorities from a polyester string 
is top spin and durability, I think you'll be very hard pressed to find anything better. So I say a lot of good things about both of these strings in a lot of my content, but it's because these strings were so important to me on my journey to find my next racket. Now you can use my discount code. The link is below in the description to get 10 to 20% off of these strings, depending on which one you get. So check it out. It supports me and it supports them. Great way to try my favorite strings of all time and support me and the other companies making them all at once. But as I was saying, it was very important to me on my racket journey to discover these strings because I was able to relax on the preferences for tightly spaced strings a little bit, which really opens up the doors. Because at the time I was comparing everything to the Ezo 98, almost nothing really compared. And if it did, there were probably a lot of things about whatever racket did compare that I just wasn't going to switch for. Anyway, the story is that I tried the Pure Aero 98 at the time when the Ezo 98 was my racket of choice. And my first impressions were that these rackets were in many ways interchangeable for me, but I did notice that Pure Aero 98 felt a little bit more stable, especially the harder that I hit, but I didn't feel like it came at the sacrifice of being able to produce less top spin. And at the time, maybe I didn't appreciate the other subtle differences enough. I ultimately just stuck with the Ezo 98 because side by side, the Ezo 98 had a more dense string pattern or string spacing, I should say, noticeably. So without seeing too much of a reason to switch which, why would I? So I didn't. I walked away from my time with the Pure Aero 98 initially, appreciating the racket for what it was, and for some of its notable differences, but ultimately stuck with the Ezo 98. But it planted a seed in my head, because ever since then I realized there's a racket that's pretty on par with the Ezo 98 in many ways. But I didn't really come back to that thought until some time later. Some time until the reality of Restring Zero and Toraline being so much more durable than other strings did I start to reconsider rackets again. Wasn't quite finding what I was looking for. Thought maybe I can try some different rackets or maybe even try some rackets again that I tried before. Let's open my mind to a slightly more open string pattern just because it opens the doors. Not because there's something about open string patterns that I want. Again, the reason I didn't want them is because it just meant the strings will break sooner. And also with my string of choice at the time, I was getting plenty of top spins so I didn't feel like I need to open up the string bed to get more topspin. But I thought, why not? The strings are so durable anyway. Let's just give it a try. Which is similar to that big leap I made coming back from extended length rackets. I've made some content before about how I was all about extended length rackets. I was in that rabbit hole for quite some time and ultimately came to a place where I understood there is a dilemma with extended length rackets that is extremely hard to get past. And long story short, I ultimately decided that it's impossible for me maybe to be fully happy with an extended length racket, mainly because the trade-off with how much the racket is extended, how much heavier it becomes to swing. I guess the main point would be that extending a racket half an inch only gives you an extra half inch of reach, right? But at the great cost of like 20, 25 units of swing weight. So you either just have to deal with that huge difference in swing weight, or you have to take weight out of the head, which makes the racket a lot less stable on all kinds of shots, especially volleys, but just every shot a little bit. All of that just for a half inch, I ultimately decided it's not worth it. But I went into that rabbit hole having no idea that that would be the reality at all. Like nobody talks about the correlation between swing weight and extended length rackets. So it took me going into the rabbit hole for quite some time to understand that for myself. And I took what I learned from that journey and shared it with you guys. So I'm happy to have gone through that. But who could have stopped me anyway, you know? <laughs> So similar to coming back from extended length rackets, I've come back a little bit from caring about how tight the string spacing is. And somewhere in there, I started to really care about parallel drilling. I made a video on that and small grommets also made a video on that because there are certain aesthetic details that I just cannot stomach on a tennis racket. Just in general, I'm a very picky person. Some people joke that I have OCD. Maybe I actually do. I don't know. I'm sure it's one of those spectrum things, which is funny because if I actually have OCD and you're like picking on me for having a disorder or something, then you're the jerk, right? But I think people would only make fun of you if they think that you're just being ridiculous and they use OCD as an insult. So either I do have it and you shouldn't be insulting the person or I don't have it, in which case it's just a ridiculous and picky preference that I have. Either way, I will not accept a racket if it has big grommet holes because that guarantees that some of the crosses are going to be crooked in their alignment. And as somebody who prides themselves on doing a quality string job where every string, every cross and every main is perfectly within reason straight, having big grommet holes makes that impossible. 
So, thank goodness, some racket companies manufacture their grommets to be small. I think the whole big grommet thing is really about opening up the string bed, but I prefer to do that with parallel drilling. I think it's a cleaner way to achieve the same thing. Some rackets actually do both, and the rackets that do both actually have the biggest discrepancy with crooked grommets. So, in a perfect world, I have small grommets with parallel drilling, and that actually narrows down the choices a lot. Now, I wanna talk real quick about preferences aesthetically affecting the racket choice. I think with somebody as picky as me, there is a risk of my preferences for what features are on a racket and me caring so much about that actually affecting me being honest with myself about is this racket actually best for my tennis? But I try really, really hard to put that aside. I really do. And it just so happens that like 95% of the rackets that I've tried were tried before I had any awareness of parallel drilling or small grommets. So that's a recent preference that I've acquired. So all the rackets that I didn't want before, I already knew I didn't want them. And it just so happens that, of course, most of them don't have parallel drilling or small grommets. So good riddance, you know? But you know what racket did? The freaking Pure Aero 98. And I actually noticed this with Babolat now, is so many of their rackets have both parallel drilling and small grommets, which makes me appreciate Babolat so much because as somebody who feels like their preferences are unrecognized, unappreciated, and often called ridiculous, it's honestly pretty validating to look at a brand like Babolat and see, hey, they do all of that stuff on their rackets and they've been doing that for a long time. I never noticed. And they don't even really market that. So once I became aware of this and then saw that Babolat does this on a lot of rackets, it really made me feel like, you know what? There are engineers making rackets out there for some of the most successful racket brands of all time, and they care. They're putting that on their rackets. So you guys say whatever you want to say. I can always tell myself that even if everyone else thinks I'm crazy, I'm sure Babolat doesn't. Or maybe they do, in which case we're all crazy. <laughs> but Babolat is really one of the most successful racket brands of all time. That's not even a debate. And they care enough to have it on their rackets. So, you know, it helps me sleep at night. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. I'd also like to point out that there are a couple of other racket brands that seem to have that level of detail. I could be wrong, but it might actually only be head. Some of the higher end, or I guess like more advanced models of the Gravity family, have parallel drilling and small grommet holes, as well as some of the radicals. Of course, I had to go back and try some of them because those happen to fit my preferences. Oh, you know what? Dunlop. The CX200 Tour 1820 has small grommets and parallel drilling. Let me say one more crazy thing. It's not enough to just have small grommets and parallel drilling. You have to have it on every single grommet where it would be crooked otherwise. The Pure Aero 100 has two grommets towards the top and the bottom where you can see a crooked cross. And to me, that's just like, oh, you were so close. You were so close. Why didn't you make that one grommet just a little bit smaller? Why? Why didn't you do that? Because you did it on the Pure Aero 98. Why didn't you do it on the 16 by 19 Pure Aero 100? Why, Babolat? Just tell me. Why? Because <laughs> what if I prefer that racket? Like, what if something about it is better for my tennis? And I'll tell you this. I've compared the two rackets. I would pick the Pure Aero 98 anyway. On paper, it's more my kind of racket. It's a thinner beam. And side by side, it's actually a little bit more comfortable. It's a little bit more controlled, right? Smaller head size, 16 by 20 versus 16 by 19. It's, it's more my cup of tea. So thank goodness, right? <laughs> oh man, that was a close call. And there's a couple of other rackets out there that have almost everything perfect because all the features and all the specs are there, but there's like one grommet. <laughs> and I think the Pure Strike VS is one of them, actually. I doubt that I'd really want that racket. But yeah, that fact alone is enough to just no. Oh, you know what? The Pure Strike 16x19 and the 18x20 are by my standards in that way perfect, but I much prefer how the Pure Aero 98 plays. So I've tested those two. I went through a phase of wanting to want those more, but now I'm at a point where I want to want this more, and I just do. I can't lie to myself. I play better tennis with this racket. I get more topspin, and just other things about the way the racket is just agrees with my tennis more. But it's also really nice that the handle mold is a little bit longer than it is on the Pure Strikes. Actually, the Pure Aero 98 is one of the only rackets out there that's a standard length racket that has a handle length that is comparable to the length common on Yonex rackets especially the Ezo 98. That was a very generously long handle mold where it was no problem to have two hands on the backhand. 
most rackets come a little short for me. But I will say the Dunlop CX200 Tour was equally good in that way. So I also wanted to want that racket. I kind of wanted to want a Dunlop. Like who wants a Dunlop, right? I'd be such a snowflake. <laughs> but that racket is so low in swing weight spec. It's an 18 by 20, which is really cool, but I just can't get the top spin that I want with that racket. It is such a dense 1820. It is so dense. Like you could barely fit a French fry through the little holes around the sweet spot on that Dunlop. Also super low twist weight, probably because the head size is so small. It's one of those rackets that when you buy it, you're gonna have to put so much lead on it, like under the grommets, under the head guard. You might even need to put more just to get that stability and that swing weight to a place where you can keep up with the heavy hitters. And all that, I still wouldn't be getting the top spin I wanted, so the journey continued. Anyway, there's probably details and steps here and there with all the rackets I've tried, but in a nutshell, that's the story. Those are the things I came to look for in a racket somewhat recently, and I went back through quite a few rackets that I had already tried just to see after realizing that they have parallel drilling and small grommets, I was able to rule them out eventually. But it's that set of preferences that really brought me back to trying the Pure Aero 98 again with some hope because now I know Restring Zero is durable enough for me to not feel like I'm prematurely breaking strings in a slightly more open string pattern. So I was more open to the idea of this rather open 16 by 20 string pattern. And having already tried the racket before with good impressions, minus the slightly more open string pattern, I didn't have any faults on the racket actually. So it was a pretty clean slate. I didn't feel like there was any hump to have to get over to accept this racket. The only one really was that the string pattern's more open and I'm gonna break strings more often, but again, restring zero, tour line, wasabi, not a problem. Now I do break strings a little bit sooner, but it's still way more durable than it would be with a regular string in this racket, night and day. One more thing I'll say is for quite some time, I was kind of an anti-Babolat guy. Now I should say, when I got back into tennis after a long story, that's a whole story for another video. I got back into tennis and I got more serious. I bought like my first real tennis racket and it was the most recent generation of Aero Pro Drives, which is the Pure Aero line before they called it the Pure Aero. So I bought the most recent one before they changed names. And I can't say I was a Babolat guy at the time. I wasn't even really aware of who the pro players were. I wasn't like, you know, watching Nadal hit forehands and think, I want that racket. I was actually hitting with a group of a bunch of 3-5 doubles guys, and I was demoing rackets from a shop, but also trying rackets from some of the friends in that group. I just really liked one of the guys' Pure Arrows, or Aero Pro Drives, I should say, and I think he was hitting with one from the generation before, and I just thought, I'll get the newer one of those. Didn't put too much thought into it, and I don't think my tennis was developed to the point to be really able to deeply appreciate whatever that racket offered, but it felt good at the time. And even then I was kind of a topspin heavy player for whatever level I was. And that racket seemed to hit the ball the way that I wanted to hit the ball. So without much thought, that was my next racket. And it was maybe for a couple of years until I felt like I'm just not able to hit through the ball sometimes. I just felt like I always had to brush over every shot. At some point I got really sick of that. <laughs> and I impulse bought something that I thought would just be the opposite. And then a different demo rabbit hole started, but this was a while ago. This was a long time ago. I don't even want to get into that story, but the point is that my first real racket was a Babolat. And it was like the most Babolat of Babolats. It was the pure arrow of the time. It was the Aeropro Pro Drive. But after getting so sick of that racket and kind of becoming aware of the stereotype that every pure arrow or Aero Pro Drive user at the time was just some like Nadal copycat. And also being aware that Babolats felt a certain way. They kind of had like this hollow, stiff, spinny feel. I went a long time just being sick of that. Like I really didn't want anything like that in a tennis racket. The rackets that I was seriously using for quite some time then initially was like a Techstream 95 by Prince for several months. And then I think I bought a Pro Staff and I used that for a couple of years. It was the autograph model. And then I bought a Head Gravity Pro and a Head Gravity Tour, the first generation of them. And for quite some time I was using both and then ultimately decided I preferred the Pro and went some years with that being my main racket. And this is all before my YouTube channel. But throughout that period, I kind of was an anti babolat guy. So it's not like I came into this racket with any intrigue about the players that are endorsing the Babolat now. If anything, it was kind of hard to come around to thinking I would use Babolat again because there's still a little bit of anti babolat inside of me. But I opened my heart to Babolat a little bit because through the nature of what I do, I gotta try what rackets are hot, you know? But I was genuinely intrigued because with how I felt about Babolat, I did notice 
that their stiffness ratings over time have come down a bit. And I was like, okay, that's interesting because I remember when your RAs were like super high 60s and I feel like even 70 or something on the pure drives, which just like offended me <laughs> at the time. But now we're talking like mid 60s and I'm like, okay, that's, that's a little more reasonable. And their string patterns were starting to become a little bit tighter. I remember at some point they were just huge. Just a couple generations ago, those pure arrow, the, the string spacing was just, it was huge. It was so far apart, like ridiculous. So yeah, if anything, it was kind of hard for me to come around and accept that I might like a Babolat racket. And that's the truth. That's where we're at. I really like this racket. I pointed this out in another video that I recently posted about why I would pick Babolat over Yonex. I mean, the main reason is because this Babolat works a lot better for me than Yonex rackets did. But I also used Yonex as an example to point out that people's impression of quality is a little bit inflated due to something I'm calling tolerance control. Everyone says quality control, but it's a slippery slope because when you say quality control, a company that has better quality control is now just being looked at as having better quality in every regard. And that was the point I wanted to make in that video. And I think most people got that point, but a couple people had an issue with that, which I understand. And some people even accused me of shilling, which is really funny because I just had the realization the other day and I told a couple friends and whatever and a couple of other content creators because the conversation came up about shilling in general as a mutual complaint that some influencers have that they get accused of shilling. And sure, some influencers might be, but some influencers totally aren't but they're still gonna get accused for it anyway, so it's like really annoying. Now, I'll just say this, and some people are gonna say like, well, this is just what somebody shilling would say, but I have not shilled a single thing on my channel. I have zero interest in doing that. It's not a sustainable endeavor. If I'm trying to push a product that I don't use, or I use it because I'm getting paid to use it and it kind of makes my tennis suck a little bit, then I'm just selling out my tennis for some small amount of commission money on YouTube. Like that's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is going deep in the rabbit hole to find something I absolutely love enough to think that I can't find anything better. And then once I settle on that, I get excited about it and I talk about it. And if I'm lucky enough, I can formulate a relationship with that company to help promote their product and support me a little bit in the process. And that's a beautiful thing because it's something that I genuinely love and the company is happy that I genuinely love their product. And then on the consumer side, the consumers trust that I genuinely love that product. And if they decide to purchase it, they get a small discount, I get a small commission, and the company gets to sell the product. And everybody's just happy. So it was very interesting that just the other day after that video, I got accused of shilling. And I think it's mostly because maybe I was just riding Babolat's handle too hard. So not to defend myself or anything, but I would like to maybe refine my points a little bit for anyone that thought perhaps I am riding Babolat's handle too hard. I have no loyalty to Babolat. I don't have any loyalty to any brand whatsoever. What I'm loyal to is what I love what I care about. Like I am loyal to parallel drilling and small grommets. It just so happens that Babolat is one of the brands that features both. And for that same reason, I also really gave head rackets a chance. I gave that Dunlop racket a chance. Didn't quite click with me. I had to look past my own resistance to the brand of Babolat to pick this racket. And the reasons I was able to do that is what I got so excited about in my video. And I guess I got so excited about that, that people actually think I'm shilling the racket but I don't even have a relationship with Babel. Like Babel is such a big, they're so far out of my reach, guys. I have no reason to like corrupt the integrity of what I say to try to push this racket. So no, I'm not shilling anything and I'm certainly not shilling this racket. <laughs> But I do want to say this one thing about quality control, about tolerance control, about Yonex and Babolat. I view Yonex as probably having the best quality of racket manufacturing overall. Either Yonex is as good, worst case scenario, Yonex is either as good as all the other big names or they're a little better. That's what I think. So if I could have Yonex manufacture the Babolat racket, maybe I would. So let's put it that way. They don't. The only way to get the Piero 98 is from Babolat. And these rackets are made in China like every other brand, pretty much, except Yonex, right? So yeah, maybe that kind of puts into perspective how I view Yonex and how I respect their quality. But I wanted to make another point, and I did make this in my last video, but some people tried to make the point that Babolat's quality control is not on point or they don't care as much as a company like Yonex. Now here's where I think those people are missing some very important details, okay? Babolat is a step above other companies because, now I'm not saying Yonex, 
saying everybody else but Yonex. Babolat is a step above other companies in the sense that they actually offer the ability to buy matched rackets, okay? So that means that they have ways of measuring rackets and then pairing them and selling them together. I'm not sure if that comes at any extra cost. I think the catch is that you just have to buy two rackets because they're matched. So maybe that's a win-win thing. Babolat takes the extra time to match their rackets, but they get to sell two at a time if somebody decides to buy matched rackets. Yonex, on the other hand, takes the extra time somewhere in the assembly process to somehow close the gap between differences in specs across their rackets. Now, I'm going to assume, I don't know if anybody knows this, somebody out there knows this, but I'm going to assume that Yonex, for the most part, manufactures their racket pretty much exactly the same way as everybody else does. And by the time it gets to the very final steps of manufacturing, it has the same general quality control or tolerance differences that other rackets have. But I think that is where Yonex takes the extra time to go inside the racket somewhere to balance things out. Like, oh, this racket's a few grams heavier and two points more headlight. You know what? Let's add some weight to the handle in a position where we can add the weight and affect the balance to make it roughly the same as the other rackets. So they have a target range of tolerance that is smaller than the target range of other companies. And I think that's how they do it. I don't think that their manufacturing process when they're putting rackets in with all the mold and the layups and the carbon and inflating it inside of the mold and then letting it cure and then painting it. I don't think it's in those steps that they are so surgically precise with such vastly superior materials that they are able to achieve a tighter tolerance at that stage. I don't think that's the case. I think it all happens after all that's done. They do some small tweaks, put a little bit of weight here and there to balance things out. And even then, guys, if you buy two random Yonex rackets of equal model and everything, those two rackets are not going to be as closely matched, right, unless you get really lucky. Most of the time, two random Yonex rackets of the same model will not be as closely matched as actual matched rackets from Babolat. That's my argument, okay? And that is why Babolat is a step above other companies. So if you actually want to get matched rackets, you can get matched rackets from Babolat. And to me, that says something about how much they care about the consumer caring. So Yonex and Babola actually approach the same desire from two different angles. Babola manufactures their rackets. They get their rackets made to whatever tolerance control or tolerance range that they are deeming as acceptable, right? Which is pretty industry standard. I think companies like Head and Wilson and et cetera, they all kind of have the same window of tolerance and Yonex is like twice as tight as those other brands. Instead of taking the time to close the gap on every single racket, they will measure some of the rackets and match them up and pair the rackets that are more alike to each other. Whereas Yonex will take all the rackets and try to close the gap more so than other companies will. So if you're going to say that Yonex, because buying two random rackets, those rackets are more likely to be similar to the next one, that's why they're better than every single brand, I feel like you're forgetting that Babolat offers a way to buy matched rackets. And I also think that you're inflating this concept of tolerance control to mean that Yonex rackets are actually better. Like, what does that even mean better? Do Babolat rackets just break in your hand for no reason or something? I haven't heard of that happening. So what do you mean by quality? How do you, the consumer, determine the quality of the racket? Is the only way you determine quality from the assumptions you make about when you measure one random racket and then measure another random racket, and then one racket is like a few grams heavier and a couple more points headlight, and therefore it's of less quality? Because to me, that's not quality, that's tolerance. And actually, on a manufacturing level, on a technical level, that's what that's called. It's called tolerance control. They literally set a boundary for what is an acceptable range of tolerance. They'll maybe pick a target weight. Okay, 310 grams. If this racket is 315 or 305, that's fine. If it's anything else, we're either going to make adjustments to it or it doesn't make the cut. That's tolerance control. It is not quality control. So that's my point. I think that's a fair point to make. And if me making that point somehow makes it seem like I'm shilling Babolat, I don't care. In my opinion, that's on you for not understanding the difference between quality and tolerance.
But if for some reason you have an experience of Babolat rackets just breaking for no reason, and Yonix is never breaking, okay. But I've never heard of a story like that. There is the occasional story from some brands of some models that have paint defects. For example, I had a Wilson autograph, Pro Staff, where that velvet matte finish would just peel off like a sunburn. Now we can just flat out say that that's not tolerance control, that's bad quality paint or defective paint. And Wilson replaced my rackets with warranties. They actually just gave me free rackets. This was a long time ago before I had any influence on YouTube. They honored the integrity of their brand and sent me free rackets, which is why I painted that pro staff actually. If you've ever seen my video on, it was just a short, a YouTube short of my custom painted pro staff. I think it was called something like I ruined my pro staff or I ruined my tennis racket. Hmm. It was a cool paint job. And I think I've heard recently of some head rackets just breaking at the throat a couple times. And also Wilson, I had their grommets from a labs racket just break on me for no reason. And that was happening to several people. It was also happening on some of the blades, which are not a labs model. I can kind of forgive the labs model because it's kind of like a prototype. That was also happening on production ready blades. Now there's probably a story out there about Babolat having a similar problem. I'm just assuming so. I just happen to not have come across it. Maybe it's because I went so long not buying Babolats, but Babolat is one of the most popular brands. So I also kind of feel like if there's that many Babolats out there, I should have heard something by now. But all in all, most of these racket brands and companies, they have their ish together. Most of these brands aren't just shipping a bunch of defective rackets all the time. Most of the time it's good, but occasionally something goes wrong and it does hurt their reputation sometimes. But hopefully they do their best to make things right in the end. So that's all I got to say for this video, except while I may seem extremely close, and I guess I am actually, to saying that the Pure Aero 98 might be my racket of choice very soon, there is one potential contender, and it will be in my next video. So stay tuned and subscribe so you don't miss it. And hopefully by the time that I made that video, I can tell you if I've ruled that racket out or not. So I very much look forward to that video and finding out if that racket is a worthy rival to this one or not. I guess it's worthy enough to make me wonder, but we'll give it a little bit more time. Just a little bit, because I want to know what my next racket is. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. It was really nice to include a little playtest footage in this video. It's been a while. And for the record, the person I'm hitting with in the playtest footage is a very good tennis player. I'm not sure if he had any professional ambitions as a tennis player, but he's very solid and he's currently ranked somewhere UTR 12 something. I don't think he minds me saying all that, but I might be working with him on some future content. He has a great eye for technique and gameplay. And I feel like between me being such a racket nerd, but also a relatively serious tennis player, he could kind of be the other side of the coin. Super serious tennis player, high level, really strong ability to analyze gameplay and technique with some intrigue and interest in the nerdy side of tennis rackets. But together we both share a great passion for tennis and it's wonderful to be able to hit with him and get a taste of that that level of tennis. So stay tuned for content like that. Be sure to like and subscribe. I'll even leave a link to his podcast, which he just started in the description, along with all my discounts for all the products. I also use Linktree now, so you can click one link and kind of more easily or quickly see everything. Discounts on Restring Zero, my favorite string. I got it in my Piero 98 here. Toraline Wasabi, it's my other favorite string. I just broke it on the other Pure Arrow that I'm using, but I will be stringing it up soon. We got Grip Liner, we got RTP, and we also have my Amazon storefront, which I'll be highlighting in future content more but I'm linking products that I use often to modify my rackets, as well as some accessories I might use, like my rebound net that I have in some of my videos, or some of my favorite socks, some antiperspirant hand lotion for those really sweaty days. All in all, it's more products that I swear by that you can buy on Amazon. So if you want to check out any of that stuff and help out the channel and or get a discount, all those links are below in the description. You can also just buy me a coffee, which I won't actually blow on coffee or just send a little something on PayPal if you want to. All of those links are down below in the description. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. And I am very excited for my next couple of videos. And I hope you are, too. All right. It's time to call it a night. I will see you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye now.